yes, <coughs> summarizing uh, international logistics. Uh, <coughs> more standardized products, and I would also say more standardized uh, load carriers, containers, which gives advantages connected to scale and also connected to sourcing. The sizes of the, of the batches is increasing because you need, uh, in, in many cases, because there are unified standardized products. <coughs> Fewer suppliers, more concentrated relations, and, uh, <coughs> and the costs, not necessarily the prices, will become more important. And that has to do with integration, that uh, uh, integration between suppliers and, and uh, buyers may, may result in some kind of profit sharing. And then you have open book accounts and, uh, and things like that. Uh, <coughs> I would say that this is an ideal Id idealized situation. In reality, it doesn't work like that in many, in many cases. You have, you have the prices, and they don't necessarily engage in, in open book accounts and, uh, and partnerships like that. But in some cases where you have, <coughs> where you have large um, or, or expensive or large flows of, uh, of, of, of goods going between buyer and supplier, you may have uh, a more dense uh, vertical collaboration. Reduced number of layers in the distribution chain. I refer to then configuration one in the in the case of Norway China tendency towards more direct shipments, uh, but not in all all respects. It depends on the nature of the good. Um, <coughs> more reflected attitudes to regarding outsourcing and reengineering meaning that there is also a tendency that activities are taken in-house again, as we, as we talked about on the, on the previous lecture. Big multinational players, <coughs> instead of uh, many in the independent competitors. Uh, information and communication technology is in increasingly important. Again, um, configuration one in the Norwegian China and Norway China case, more direct distribution. Configuration four, in uh, particularly, is uh, belongs here, whereas configuration one belongs here. So we use both differentiated strategies. Information and communication technology is, uh, is a very important uh, part here. Makes it m much easier to, to align different players in a, in a supply chain. Cost factors has to do with how you choose to outsource, where you choose to outsource to, and which again affects all the, all the flows and the setup of, uh, of the transportation and distribution chain as well. Yep. Information and communication technology. Okay. Yep. Um, <coughs> one, one important uh, one important, uh, let's say, subset of information and communication technology is uh, ECRP, which is enter enterprise resource planning systems. And that <coughs> those systems are, we have a course here at the master's level in, uh, in, in ERP. 
and they <coughs> those systems they they uh, sort of integrate uh, different processes within a company like uh, the links between human resource planning inventory holding inventory holding uh, different parts of production processes so it, it sort of monitors gives information about the flows and the resources that are needed in a often quite complex production process and some <coughs> of these systems are also uh, used between between players in a supply chain like for instance the big Norwegian oil and gas company Statoil they demand their at least their most important suppliers to integrate with Statoil's ERP system so that they can monitor what is going on also at the suppliers so that they can <coughs> sort of be able to to uh, avoid disruptions, avoid stockouts, or do avoid that there is not enough people available to do a certain type of operation and things like that. And also to monitor the development in costs, how a project, like say an engineering to order project develops over time, is, uh, is also <coughs> it often very big and complex process, pro uh, pro projects and processes and then these types of systems are used so those of you who continues with uh, with the, um, the masters in logistics can uh, attend the course to to learn about ERP then <coughs> summarizing the the cost side here a bit more specifically how you should address uh, let's say the optimization of, uh, of logistics costs um, I'm I have used the word reducing and you will in during or throughout your studying here you will meet phrases like minimization cost minimization lead time minimization and things, things like that I am actually preferring to use optimization, optimizing instead of reducing. Because you might not necessarily always want to minimize, but you want to optimize according to the, your customer's needs. That is why configuration one in the China Norwegian case, in Norway case, may be a better strategy than configuration 4 even if configuration 4 is highly likely to be cheaper I mean the lower uh, there are lower unit costs because of the scale and scope effects in, in configuration 4 with the two distribution centers than in configuration 1 with the direct shipments but some customers <coughs> may want short lead time direct shipments because they, they are dealing with high-value goods and impatient customers. But anyway, uh, given the end customer's needs as a constraint here, you may of course want to, want to reduce the costs, but not to such an extent that you violate or, uh, or a conflict with the, with the <coughs> needs of the, of the customers. <coughs> Tidy, tedious work to calculate freight duties, the customs uh, brokerage, what takes place in the distribution centers and uh, from time to time in the ports, and inventory, <laughs> inventory carrying costs. Uh <coughs> You need to take account of, let's say, having people flown over to the other side of the globe to support different operations. So there are there are also aspects that is is from time to time forgotten that 
Uh, there may be quality issues connected to, and now we are talking about, let's say, also the outsourcing part of it. That there may be quality issues that can be quite expensive to correct, and you may have to to fly people over to uh, to uh, to assist. <coughs> I know that one one producer of of uh, electromechanical equipment for the offshore offshore oil and gas industry in this town has had problems with their supplier of uh, of steel constructions which takes place in another country and a lot of uh, efforts and money has been spent to amend the quality problems so that is also an issue Eliminating variability of uh, of uh, trans transit times because the practical implication of such variability or variance in transit times may be that you need to use or to perform abatement actions. You need to take steps to to uh, to correct or to to reduce the transit times on a more ad hoc basis. Means that you need to, to do it on the spot and perhaps use more premium freight and so on to amend this, which can be very costly. <coughs> so, and that goes with what I'm saying, optimizing instead of only reducing, is that you can, pay a, you can choose to pay an insurance premium by choosing a more direct service if time is uh, is critic in this and i mean this can this can be uh, i mean if you if you are going at some point in time perhaps to write a master's thesis on an issue like international transportation and logistics and you you will then often choose to write a thesis for a or in contact or in collaboration with a company and if they have a variabli uh, variability problem in their transit times, which I know for sure that many has, it's a good topic to investigate the sources of variability and how, how they can be amended. How the variability can be amended. Tariff engineering means to be very aware of the uh, issues connected to duties, customs, rates that you need to pay to get goods from, let's say, one country to another. And this is why, for instance, Toyota has set up production and Honda has set up production plants in Europe to take advantage of, of this. Uh, the conditions that are um, between the EU and, I mean, EU-located production facilities and EU-located suppliers, are <coughs> it's much easier than uh, than uh, let's say shipping shipping the cars in from Japan, and you need to pay more more du more uh, duties for that. But they do it anyway. But uh, <coughs> not all not all models are are shipped in from Japan. Some of them are produced in Europe. Consolidate. <coughs> Here we have this uh, focus on the configurations again. Here is a focus on consolidation. You may want to consolidate, but you may not want to consolidate to such an extent that lead times are increasing out of proportion, out of, let's say, the confidence area that you, are, uh, <coughs> that you can live with as a, as a supplier or, uh, and or customer. So it's a matter of address cost of different transport modes. Use the one that is suitable for an adequate level of service. And please note the word adequate, because you don't need to do it better. In many cases, you don't need to do it better than adequate. 
because better may mean may imply that you pay a lot more than you ne actually need to. And if you have <coughs> less than container truck uh, container loads or less LTL means less than truck load, you may want to consolidate. And you may also want to try to cooperate with others to, to fill a ship or to fill a truck. That is what is meant by when we discussed the China Norwegian Norway case, that you may have to collaborate with other companies or other other consolidators to exploit these these scale effects. So that was <coughs> International logistics as a as a separate topic. Uh, now I will continue with seaports, uh, which is also a part of this uh, this chain uh, configuration. One in the China Norway case dealt with ports as uh, as as shipment points and not uh, not the distribution centers. We will here see that ports are achieving a more let's say complex role in the international transport part of the supply chain so many ports are taking a more let's say more comprehensive responsibility for <coughs> for other parts in the supply chain than that they used to they may do three pl services third party logistics services which means that they do something with the cargo, not only move boxes or uh, pallets around, but they can do labeling, they can do uh, warehousing, in inventory holding, they can uh, actually also do some EC assembly work, which is often done on cars. In Seebrugge in Belgium, they import cars and they import from Japan. Even if Japan has production in Europe, they import quite a lot as well. And those cars are stored, stacked very, with a very narrow space between them when they are, uh, when they are um, shipped on board a, a car freight vessel from Japan to Europe. So when they arrive at Seebrugge, <coughs> they are the mirrors. They are uh, they are assembled in Belgium in order to save space and the transportation from Japan to Europe. It's ch cheaper to postpone the assembly of of the of the mirrors, which widens, increases the the width of the car. Uh, and to do that on arrival in, in, in Europe instead of doing it in Japan and use more space under transportation. So ports is a gate, kind of a gate, uh, which uh, then uh, you, know, you, you see intuitively what that means. You get goods in to the port and you transfer it normally to another mode or you may have uh, transshipments from smaller to larger ships so it's an interface you might say in the in the transport chain um <coughs> interface linking maritime transportation and inland transportation is very often uh, often the case uh, but this second point is increasingly important these days, that they act as a base for logistics production, living information production and international trade, as well as a base for the economic development of the hinterland. And uh, actually quite some of the assignments that has been uh, written in this course uh, in the earlier years has been about ports as engines for hinterland development, international ports and their importance for 
for hinterland development, for regional development in the in the areas around them. <coughs> and there is um, a PhD that was written back in 2000, and I think it was in 2009, by, an ad, uh, by a Dutch uh, researcher who, who focused strongly on the ports as uh, engines for economic growth in the area. Okay, let's see here. So it facilitates the transfer of cargo and passengers from vessel to and from other vessels, other modes of transport on the shore side. It's o often good to start with a kind of a d definition of what we are actually going to deal with when we talk about, in this case, ports. The throughput <coughs> is the amount of cargo and passengers, tons, number of individuals, uh, packs stand for passengers, TUs, 20 foot equivalent units, cubic meters, or value terms, to measure throughput. Um, this is important, and it's important to, to have, uh, to keep good track of these uh, statistical numbers. Because if you run a port <coughs> as a part of this international transport and, uh, and uh, distribution chain, you would normally like to benchmark yourself against other ports, at least if you are, if you are in a position where you really need to be efficient. And some ports are in competition with other ports. Other ports are not very much in competition with other ports. Many ports are acting as monopolists. And uh, we'll come back to some, some regulatory issues uh, in that respect a bit later on. A port might constitute several terminals, which specializes in various types of cargo. And they may be run by private terminal op operators. And there are now, as we shall see later on, a large number of, uh, or a number of large multinational terminal operators, which are specialized in operating big, big port terminals. And they specialize in uh, various types of handling where container handling is a, is a strong market segment in, in that respect. And the ownership, as I said, may be uh, public, private, or a mix, public-private partnership. So <coughs> there is a, there are a very important port, so it's a very important interface in the in the world trade flow. When we address world tra trade flows, volume <coughs> world trade volume is handled to sea ports, or the and then we define that as trade between countries. The rest is handled by uh, by road and uh, and railways but a lot of the volumes is handled through seat ports. So there is <coughs> an increasing focus on efficiency in the ports. Um, and also efficiency in the ports with respect to mode choice. I mean, if you consider deep sea international trade flows, you need to have a port on each side of this, uh, this trade flow. I mean, between, uh, between China and the United States, you don't <coughs> get far without the ship, so it goes without saying that you need a port. Likewise, between, uh, between China and Europe, uh, even if you can, in theory, uh, manage to do it by rail, but you don't do that. It's too, it's too far. 
but in short sea shipping, which is, uh, let's say, if you consider Europe, then you have uh, you have ship routes going between uh, between Spain and Belgium, between the Netherlands and uh, Norway, Sweden, the UK, and so on. Those shipping routes are um, in competition with road transport and rail transport. And there has been an issue with too much road transport on the European continent, too much road freight transport on the European continent. And one of the reasons for that has been claimed, at least, that it has to do with the lack of efficiency in the, in the short sea shipping transport chain. And one of the sources of efficiency has been claimed to be the ports, that I, they are not that efficient. Uh, I think the picture is quite mixed there, but some of you Norwegians may have seen the debate that is going on now about uh, trade unions and the workers in the ports and how they are uh, actually quarreling, fighting. Uh, for they fight the, the port workers are fighting for their rights to have a monopoly in serving the, the loading and unloading of ships. Because that has been, an, uh, historically, it has been, uh, they have been uh, in the power of taking care of that. Whereas the, the, the port authorities, the port owners, they want to, to get rid of that monopoly and let uh, the crew on, the, on board the ships take a more active part in loading and unloading. And so does the ship owners and the cargo owners, because they see that this <coughs> this monopoly is a source of inefficiency. So they see it from their point of view, whereas the workers they see it otherwise. They see that if you if you break this, you are back to the uh, to the ancient times where where the work conditions are uh, are suffering and so on. I'll show you some numbers later on on, on port efficiency. Um, port users, again a definition, they are those that utilize the port as part of the transportation process of moving cargo and passengers from origin to destination. Or those who provide extra services. And the third party logistics providers is, is, uh, is a category of activities that are often located in the port to take care of value-added services like assembling mirrors on Japanese cars or splitting, uh, let's say, loads of orange juice from Brazil to Europe that is taking place in Seebrugge in Belgium, where there is a factory that uh, takes all the big quantities of orange juice and splits it into the nice uh, units that we buy in the Norwegian shops here. So the labeling, branding and everything is, is done in Belgium. So that is, also that is another example of third-party logistics services. And the nice uh, thing about that in terms of port efficiency, when you have more activities located in the port, can you imagine what that is? If you think about the competition between, if, if you think it now in terms of short sea shipping in Europe, for instance, and you are focusing on efficiency in the ports as a means for improving the conditions for sea transport, a competitive position for the sea transport. Then you need to address the cost structure of the port. And the port has a large amount of fixed costs, capital equipment, cranes, you have the case, 
the warehouses, all the technical equipment for loading and unloading and things like that. So there is a <coughs> there is this well known now this well known illustration where you have this as uh, as the average cost curve with <coughs> high investments, low variable costs. This is and this is quantity. So the higher the volume, the lower the costs. And <coughs> when you consider only the transport part of this, I mean the part that is dealing with just throughput and not the other extra services that I mentioned there, because these extra services can actually be quite comprehensive. In some ports you have quite a lot of activity going on, which is not only taking care of throughput, but they're also taking care of um, value-added services. So what can <coughs> the outcome with respect to the cost structure for throughput? can be affected in a, in a quite nice way. Because <coughs> what you do when you introduce, let's say, a large amount of third-party logistics services in a port is that you can split the investments on to a larger number of players. So the fixed cost can be shared between the third-party logistics operators, which may be big and uh, they do a lot of work, and the investments uh, and, and the throughput operations. Let's say the the thing that the, the, the operations that takes care of the transportation side of the story. So this can actually re result in something like this. It doesn't affect the throughput costs because this is the variable cost of shipping one container to the port. It's not affected by the variable costs are not much affected. But because you share, this one is splitted between and. The throughput operations is that you can get something like that, which means that the port is not that much dependent on volume to become efficient as it used to be without the third party logistics uh, services. I'm taking a lot of assumptions now because I, I assume that uh, <coughs> the amount of land is not affected by uh, 3PL services. I assume that uh, the some of the some of the buildings and the infrastructure can be more efficiently used by by engaging in 3PL operations in addition to just throughput. But you you get my you get my point. And in terms of, let's say the short sea shipping 
part of this uh, industry, you are often in a situation where you have quite low volumes. There are lots of smaller ports that are engaged in this uh, service. And so we can say that, or uh, we can say that the, the, the throughput volumes are not, not that high, which means that you may have a demand for port services that looks something like this. It's not <coughs> here where you use your capacity very efficiently. Many of the smaller ports are more on this side where you have a lot of excess capacity but you and, you and you and you get a kind of a an average cost problem. So what you see here is that when you if you manage to split the initial investments on several activities or more than just a throughput activity you get this C with thr throughput only, and you get the C and then the average cost because this, this horizontal line means average costs with T plus what I could say is uh, logistics operations, more extended logistics operations. And this is because you can, if you are lucky and if you are good at it, you can manage to, to split <coughs> the investments on, so that you can also uh, take advantage of splitting the, the, the high investment cost between throughput operations and 3PL operations by sharing facilities. This uh, <coughs> port south of Oslo, Drammen port, has been quite good at that. So they have been very focused on cost sharing and try to exploit such nice effects because you see here that uh, I need to explain this a bit. C T plus L is equal to costs with cost sharing and CT is throughput costs without cost sharing. So this is the idea. So it's a uh, it's a way of let's say reducing reducing throughput costs by introducing by in involving more more activities in the port. And you see here, <coughs> these are sort of throughput motivated users, so to speak. But here you get this additional services that can contribute to to a development like that. I think we keep the time for, for a change, at least almost, and break now. <laughs>